episode of Me Only at the Movies, and this episode is a Halloween special, and I know I'm pagan and I ought to say Sam Hain, but this really is a Halloween special as we're taking a look at the Halloween film franchise that started with John Carpenter's 1978 film of the same name, and is still ongoing with the latest instalment currently in the cinemas. Uh, I think uh, we may overlook Rob Zombie's reboots, though, although perhaps we'll just kind of um, say how bad they are and stuff like that from time to time. Um, but we will be looking at uh, Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, uh, even though it's not really a part of uh, the franchise as such. It hasn't got the central character Michael Myers in it, but um, we'll come on to that anyway. Uh, so, um, anyway, I'm David Yorkshire, and with me are Neil Westwood and James. Hello. 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 Now, just a quick word on Halloween celebrations in general, because there's been some controversy about cultural appropriation at Halloween, and uh, I understand that Megyn Kelly uh, may be losing her job. Poor Megyn, uh, eh? Uh, but we at Mjolnir, we're absolutely against cultural appropriation, and that's why all non-whites should not be allowed to participate in Halloween celebrations. <laughs> at all. Now, ever. Back to the <laughs> ever. <laughs> because it comes from Europe, and it's, uh, um, specifically, actually, um, people should be able to trace their ancestry back to these islands, shouldn't they? So, Absolutely. Uh, yes. Anything else is cultural appropriation. There you go. Now, back to the show. Uh, I suppose we'd better start at the beginning with the first film. Now, I personally think that it's a solid film, and in many ways a groundbreaking film. But I don't think it's a great film, and I certainly don't rate it even as one of Carpenter's best. My uh, major criticism of it would be the thinness of the plot. I don't know what you guys think about that. I don't, I don't think it really needs much of a plot. At the end of the day, it's about this escaped, um, mentally ill, um, psychotic killer who just happens to go back to where he came from and kills a bunch of babysitters. It doesn't really need anything other than that to me. Yeah, in the, the genre, it's, it's almost acceptable that you could have that kind of plot and just go with it because the fans of the slasher horror type stuff want that kind of situation rather than a deep plot and so on. So I'm more forgiven. I think Carpenter did well and obviously he founded a whole generation of these in the genre. But it's a fair criticism though about the plot if you compare it to other Carpenter's work which are very story rich. Yeah, uh, and, and it's the richness that uh, that really sort of gets me, or the lack of richness in this case. But even looking at um, the forerunners uh, that uh, appeared in the slasher genre, because we can sort of trace back the slasher genre... Oh, dear. I haven't got my teeth in today. Uh, we, we can trace the slasher genre back to two films, really, that appeared in 1960, uh, one being Peeping Tom... Uh, by Michael Powell, actually ruined his career uh, <laughs> because uh, the critics were so horrified by it at that time, you know, kind of liberal bourgeois sensibilities and all that, uh, that um, they wouldn't you know, permit him to work almost, uh, you know, he only did a few films after that. Um, so that's one of them. And the other is Psycho, of course, which everyone knows, uh, by uh, the great film director um the fat guy, Alfred Hitchcock. So, um, if you look at those two films, in comparison, Halloween doesn't really have the same depth to it, in my opinion. I can come at that at a different angle, though. I just I was thinking about... When you look at it, and it's highlighted by the later Halloween films, uh, barring the 2018 if you look at all the others where they try to add back plot or later plot or give them a backstory or a reason for existing, every time it was done, it took away from the first one, which was this. It was a sort of pure situation of a very normal, pleasant world, and then you've dropped in this evil character and you get to watch what unfolds. In a sense, it was just a 
pure example of that. What would happen if you dropped in some evil? And you almost don't need to know why it's happening. Really, it actually works better without it because you can just use your imagination. But it's, it's the process of the hunt, the fear and the experience and seeing it through people's eyes that makes it interesting. And you've also got to remember there is two versions, and there might be more for all I know, but there's two versions of the first Halloween movie. And there's another version that's come to be known as the television version in which they did add, I think it's like an extra 20 minutes of footage, which gives you a backstory. And it's got um, um, oh, Loomis in it. That. Can... And, and even though it tells you on the DVD cover 25 minutes extra footage, you get excited. You think, wow, that's extra footage. It's going to make it even better. It makes it even worse because now you know why it's happening and it's been told for you by the, the writer or whoever added these scenes in just for that criticism alone. It actually makes the film a lot worse. Yeah, yeah but, and that, uh, that I mean... Fun. Uh, that that's the fault with the Rob Z- uh, Rob Zombie. Absolutely, film. I was going to say the same. Yeah. Um, but one one of the um, I, I you know you, you're absolutely right in that um, he's Michael Myers the character is better with that air of mystery and everything. Uh, but I think that you've got to find some way to add depth, not necessarily depth in terms of action or or anything like that. But I think you've got to have a certain amount of character development somewhere because the the protagonists themselves don't really develop or anything like that do they well the thing is um in thinking about that especially laurie strode in, in most slasher movies that came after that usually the female um main character of the movie came out as a stronger woman at the end of it or they were somehow victorious over this this killer or this um, entity like Freddy Krueger or Jason Voorhees, the, the surviving female always gains something from it. But at the end of Halloween, um, she's you get this feeling this is what would actually happen to a girl. She'd be traumatized by it. She wouldn't really develop anything from that. She wouldn't develop as a character if somebody was chasing her constantly and killing all her friends. So that's that's why I, that's the way I see it. Anyway. It's an important thing as well to remember with Halloween 1 and 2 is it's all one night so you are sort of limited in how much character development you could have realistically within a matter of hours it always plays out in real time in front of you it'd be like somebody just dropping a bear in your house how much character development you're going to have as you jump out the window That that's true yeah um, and I mean the characters are realistic I'll, I'll give it that um, because um, it was actually John Carpenter's girlfriend at the time who uh, who wrote the female parts of the script. Uh, because um, totally, you, yeah, that that's right. Uh, because usually one person writes a script, and, and at the time usually it was male and everything. Uh, and um, it, it was Deborah Hill who also produced the film, uh, who uh, who wrote the female parts. To get that air of realism in there, uh, you, you know, to, so she kind of drew on her own experience as a teenager and everything. I mean, she wasn't that much older herself at that time. I think she was in her twenties. Because, I mean, these were all young film directors at the time. Uh, um, all, all the people involved with the film uh, were young, really, with the exception of Donald Pleasance. And also, uh, you know, in many ways, the main character of the movie probably isn't Laurie Strode. The main character of the movie is Michael Myers. Um, He's the one that you see transition three or four times throughout the movie. The first time you see him, he's a little kid with a mask on. The next time you see him, he's got a hospital gown on and he's he's able to drive somehow. And the next time after that, he just so happens to have collected the creepiest costume in film history. So he's the main character that develops uh, you're always seeing things through his eyes, through his vision. You always hear his breathing. The film almost says to me that he is the main character watching uh, these girls, these baby, these basketball player um, cheerleader types, and he's stalking them. So he is the main character. I don't think Laurie Strode really needed to develop that much. 
Uh, I would agree to an extent there. I think that there are two main characters. One is Michael Myers, uh, but the other is Sam Loomis. Yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, I, I think I, I, I do actually see Loomis develop over the films as well, to give it some credit for that. Well, Myers is this sort of unchanging, unstoppable force. Yeah, yeah. And like I was, I was thinking back, and I've seen some John Carpenter interviews, and I'm sure he mentioned that he based um, the, the later part of Michael Myers in the, the black um, or dark blue overalls and the white mask that seems to walk at this very steady pace but always seems to be able to jump from different parts of the town to the other. I'm sure he based that on uh, Night of the Hunter with Robert Mitchum, who was the film's about this um, this guy who stalks these two kids over over this, this particular state in America on his horse, and he just seems to be constantly coming after them at this steady pace, and uh, that's the, that's the character in itself. Yeah, you, you you're right about that. That sort of uh, relentless, unstoppable. Uh, monstrous uh, figure who's uh, irredeemably evil it's a it's, it's a good comparison actually it's actually the only film that charles lawton ever directed that uh night of the hunter no right? more as an yeah known as an actor of course but um uh, he, he uh, directed that film it was his only one very strange actually because it's a brilliantly directed film and also not long before halloween came out in fact it might have even been the year before there is a film that hardly anybody ever talks about when it comes to horror movies. And it's called Black Christmas with Margot Kidder from Superman. And it's about this creepy, psychotic serial killer who has found himself able to get into this house where all these um, babysitter, cheerleader types are, are hanging about. And, and he systematically kills them. Um, in this house one by one and i think that must have really inspired john carpenter in some way it yeah that's quite familiar doesn't it when you describe it like that and it's the same thing it's got a lot of first person perspective lots of breathing sounds lots of stocky um um like steady cam footage and yeah, that's um, that's something that uh, he uses a lot here, Carpenter, isn't it? The steady cam, uh, with these sort of uh, long, languishing shots and everything, uh, and it does two things really. One in that is that he was uh, constrained to a very tight budget, uh, which was three. Uh, well, originally it was three hundred thousand uh, dollars, but then they had to uh, pay Donald Pleasance, and so it came up to. Three hundred twenty-five thousand uh, dollars. Hmm. Uh, he got twenty-five thousand dollars for five days' work, which is not oh. bad if you can. Even now, if you can get that kind of work, it's not bad, is it? I'll um, take yeah. it. And yeah. if you consider Marlon Brando got something like fourteen million for um, four minutes in Superman. Did he really? Fourteen oh, million. It, it was something ridiculous. They had to pay that guy for for his uh, lines in Su Superman. It was like it almost like ate into their budget that much. Where they're like, "Oh God, he's asking for a lot of money. He's not in the film for more than ten minutes." Good grief! <laughs> he didn't even learn his lines either. He had them pinned up uh, all around the, you know, when he's walking around in the trial scene and everything. He had people holding <laughs> up his lines. Yeah, yeah, that's that's that's, a, that's how big he was. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, anyway, c coming back to the figure of Michael Myers then, um, uh, and we talked a little about the mask. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you know where they got the mask from, the the, the story about the mask. Do you? Oh, yeah, yeah. You can tell if you want. If there's, I'm sure there's people out there who don't know yet. Yeah, go for it. Tell the story. Um, well, they were looking for a mask that was suitably scary and everything, and um, they had a look at various different masks, and they come across came across the one of Captain Kirk. And so they uh, they removed the eyebrows, cut the eyes out a bit uh, bigger, and uh, sprayed it white. So essentially, what, I mean, it looked nothing like Captain Kirk, the original mask anyway, because they never do. But uh, 
But it's quite funny in that uh, basically what you have is a very scary William Shatner walking around yep. chasing people. <laughs> it's uh, pretty funny. Yeah. I'll, allow, I'll allow that to sink in. There's a mask made of William Shatner who, weared, who wore a hairpiece. There's a mask with hair on it too, even though the real guy was actually bald. It's, it's so weird. It's just to get your head wrapped around that, it's just so creepy. Yeah, I, I personally think that the whole episode of The Trouble with Tribbles was uh, sort of a dig at uh, Shatner's wigs. <laughs> <laughs> and ironically, the hair and the mask in Halloween looks more real than the hair in William Shatner. <laughs> that's, uh, that's true. But, but, but I think that the this idea of the mask in general is very interesting. Of course, um, there was another franchise that came a couple of years later, starting in 1980, Friday the 13th, that was pretty much a carbon copy of all this. Um, and, and also very successful, uh, but, but really a complete rip off the Friday the 13th films. But I think that this was one of the first films where you had that... Um, this idea of the mask. I personally think that it came from um, the serial killer, uh, John Wayne Gacy, uh, the clown killer. This, this idea of, uh, of the person kind of mask. You, you, you get that, of course, when um, Michael Myers is a kid, as a six-year-old, six he's dressed as a clown, if you remember. And you've, but you've also got to remember, though, there was a film about, what, seven years before that? The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And uh, Leatherface, he's got the, the creepy mask, which isn't too dissimilar in, in many ways. And that was obviously um, based on Ed Gein uh, wearing masks of the, the skins of the people he killed. Um, and, and the Michael Myers mask, I, I think, could have been slightly inspired by that too. And yeah. of course, with the Michael Myers character, the, certainly with the first and second, they made sure to make it of um, uh, flesh and blood character he wasn't meant to be supernatural or some sort of werewolf universal monster type character they wanted to make sure that you knew he was a human being just but somehow unstoppable yep yeah that, that's true he gets less and less human as the series wears on doesn't he um but um, to return to the to the mask idea that i think it's a very interesting idea both with serial killers in general like the ones we were talking about uh, and the serial killers in film uh, because the the word persona uh, in Latin uh, comes from the idea of a mask uh, which originally comes from the Greek stage and uh, sort of uh, uh, comes into the, uh, the Roman world from that in that um, they're putting on a persona just as they're putting on a mask yeah, yeah and there's like a little nod to that near the end of the, the first Halloween film where you see uh, Michael Myers as this, this shape, this creepy guy who hangs about in the background and he's briefly demasked when he's struggling with Laurie Strode um, over the banister, the stairs. She, she manages to rip his mask off and you see just for a, a couple of seconds that he is a human being. He isn't like this um, monster underneath this mask. He hasn't got any um, particularly um, strong deformations apart from the, the little bit of blood where his eyes been stabbed earlier on in the movie. He does look like a normal guy for a couple of seconds. Yeah, and it's, it's very... oh, Go for it. <laughs> Sorry, no, no, go on. Go on, you're all right. I was going to say, what was important with the demasking is you see his reaction, where it completely takes the wind out and and he's stunned, which gives you the idea that the mask isn't about hiding his identity in, like a bank robber would. There's much more to it. Yeah, yeah that, that's, um, that's very true. It's uh, something that uh, uh, I, w I was going to come on to, actually, so you've, you've set me up there nicely. Uh, and, and that's that um, if, you, if you look, it's pretty much the same uh, expression that he has when he's six years old and he's unmasked and he's done the first killing. This sort of bewilderment. Yeah. And not only that, there is something that I think is quite interesting. 
when he is demasked by his parents when he comes out of the, the front of the house and he's got the clown suit on and they take his mask off, he's, he's stunned like he's paralyzed in fear. But then not long after that, when the nurse and Dr. Loomis pull up to the gates of the hospital, Michael Myers runs up the car on all fours. He's almost like a like a cat or something like that, like animalistic. But this this mask seems to make him slow and like um, I don't know, relentless. Yeah, it's it's true. Um, I mean, uh, Michael Myers, of course, can walk faster than Chuck Norris can run. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> but but like I said, when he runs up the the front of the or the back of the car like a cat. That doesn't strike me as the sort of thing Michael Myers would do when he had the mask on. That's that's very true. Yeah, uh, you you have uh, two personalities. They they go more into that in the Rob Zombie film, don't they? Where he's making masks and things like that uh, when they explore his childhood and his adolescence and so on. Uh, but it really sort of gives the it, it spoils the air of mystery, really, about him. And, and it had gives... to give it the cliched, abusive parents' origin story, which is just garbage. Yeah, that that's right. It, it's bad on so many levels in that it, it tells the viewer what to think, rather and than... And, of course, they all had to be rednecks. <laughs> yeah. Very stereotypical. The, the guys in the hospital, redneck rapists. The family, redneck perverts and degenerates. Right through that whole film, you won't find one good man. Even the Strode uh, state agent father, he's got all these flaws in him. You see, you don't actually see any character in that that's a good, decent man without some horrible flaw or some character problem. The Loomis character's almost completely inverted into this greedy attention seeker in the Rob films, which, again, shows a consistent theme where all these men are just terrible. I, I think that that's Except, what... sorry to interrupt again, except <laughs> the Mexican, who is made, even the rapist redneck say is a good man and a hard worker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, that's so propagandistic. It's unbelievable. And they say, like uh, all your kind. <laughs> I think for me, like with the Rob Zombie version, the biggest mistake about films like that is when you start rooting for the killer, then you've lost the audience. When you actually want that killer to go out and murder everybody in that movie and be happy about it, that's not a horror movie. That's an action movie to me. Uh, Michael Myers, he, even though... Uh, I'm a little bit older now. I don't have emotional connections to the characters on that level. When you first seen that movie, you wanted all the babysitters and everybody to escape. You didn't want them to die. You didn't want Michael Myers to win. You were terrified of him. But when things like Friday the 13th, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street came out, it got to that level where Michael Myers had to play catch up with that. And I was, I was never scared by Freddy Krueger because... Like I've always said, if he came into my dreams and tried to kill me, I'd want him to tell a joke first before he killed me. So I'd at least have one less last laugh before I died. Um, but I was always terrified of Michael Myers. Yeah, and I, th I think what m makes the first film effective is that the people are so normal. And, and Carpenter, of course, wanted that. You know, he wanted everyone to be so normal and to have really normal and authentic conversations and everything. So the policeman, for example, the local Bobby, he's really nice and everything and helpful and so on, jokes with the kids. But, you know, he'll come down hard on them if they do anything wrong. It's a very normal sort of society. Uh, and that's what makes it effective. Um, because uh, And even Michael, uh, now one, one of the interesting things about um, the, the unmasking scene at the end is that um, it's not Nick Castle who, uh, who normally plays uh, Michael Myers throughout the, the film. Uh, it's actually Tony Moran. And they got an actor in who had um, this sort of innocent, angelic face. And, yeah. uh, you know, so, so, that, so that it would, you know, be shocking in how normal he was, uh, the, this guy. And, and, and this is what's terrifying about it it's it's an attack on normality you get this a lot with carpenter of course 
um, that, that it's an attack on basically ev everything that you know that you're comfortable with and, and that uh, you know this this force can come into uh, just an average everyday society because with horror films up until this point they're either set in isolated places even the Bates Motel going back to the Bates Motel or uh, um, the um, the farm in, in, Cha in Cha Texas Chainsaw Massacre these are all isolated places yeah. But this is right in the middle of suburbia. That's the good thing, thing you picked up about John Carpenter there. Maybe with the exception of Snake Plissken, there isn't many characters in his films who you watch from the, the out, well, from the get-go and think, this guy's going to win. Because everybody seems to be normal. They have, seem to have everything going against them. Even Snake Plissken, he's got explosive devices in his neck. I mean, he's not that badass if he he allowed that to happen in the first place, to be tricked into that. Everybody seems to be ultra-normal, even in They Live. The, the two main heroes of the movie are effectively Bricky's laborers, who are living in a, like a squalid um, like camp for out-of-work people. Uh, big Trouble in Little China. Um, Jack Burton, he's just this clumsy idiot. I mean, he's not going to win anything, but this amazingly... Uh, unrealistic scenario befalls him and he's expected to get out of it and it's the same with Laurie Strode she's just a normal teenager and she's got this most the most abnormal thing in the world coming after her I think what helps as well with the Michael character being so creepy is it does obviously play on the idea of you know the fear of insanity or losing your mind or the idea that someone else could because he is a very human threat. He's not an alien or a mummy that's come out of a, an ancient tomb. He's, he could be in your town today and then all could go wrong even if you live in a completely normal place. Yeah. It's very true that. And, and Carpenter's attitude to the nature of evil, I think, is very interesting in that often it just appears from nowhere. And, and you noticed this with um, Assault on Precinct 13 and the Grazes, didn't you, Neil? That's right, yeah. He seems to have this idea or notion that... I, I'm not sure if I agree with him on, on this, but he's, he seems to have this opinion that evil can affect anyone, and it's not really something that happens naturally. Um, it's something that will come upon you like a force like a demonic force or whatever it is he believes but he doesn't really seem to be the person where people become evil because they've lost their job and like they decide to go out and kill a bunch of people he seems to be of this idea that these random acts of violence and, and mental insanity just come from nowhere yeah and, and in many ways you've got uh, Dr. Loomis who's the counterpart to that in that he's quite unhinged, actually, and he gets more unhinged as the series wears on, but not in a bad way, in, in a good way, in some respects. He's, uh, he's almost kind of the counterbalance to Michael Myers in terms of, uh, you know, on the edge of reason or insanity or whatever. Yeah, and you, you don't know why... He has what his backstory with Michael really was. All he knows is that he was his doctor and that he counseled him for years. But you don't know why Loomis is so terrified of this guy. Because, let's be honest, he was a kid. He killed his sister. It's not really, it's not a huge deal in the wider scheme of things. So where did Loomis get this idea that this guy is going to escape one day and he's going to cause a lot of damage? What did he know about him? And that's the interesting thing, which they never really explain so much. It's good as well how you just hear him talk about it's the eyes that told him it all, just looking at somebody, which is a, an instinct everybody has to some extent, but because he spent so long with him, he's had enough time to get a feeling there's that about him. Well, it's, it's interesting that um, perhaps there's a sneaking suspicion that he actually 
is bonded to and needs uh, Michael Myers to an extent. You get this played out in the new one, don't you, in the uh, one that's at the cinema at the moment, really, with the new psychiatrist. I uh, can't remember his name now. Yeah, I forget his name. It's it, the... Will we ruin it? Will we spoil it? Or will we, will we save it? But the doctor that... We're giving, he, right, spoiler <laughs> warning for everybody. It's your fault yeah, after this. Yeah, yeah. So, so don't come and like send me nasty emails or anything like that. But the doctor in the new film might not be who he says he is. And I think that's safe. Safe, safe enough. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's sort of um, a bad Loomis. Yeah, yeah, a bad Loomis. <laughs> and a very convenient plot mover. That's right. Um, it's interesting, actually, in that uh, Donald Pleasance is remembered for two roles, really, uh, two big roles. And one is, uh, of course, uh, Dr. Sam Loomis, and the other is Blofeld. And they're two sort of slightly unhinged characters, but one has gone one way and one has gone another. Interestingly, of course, uh, Loomis develops a scar down one side of his face <laughs> after Halloween 2. That's right, he gets the burns, and uh, is it Halloween 6 he comes back? And he's got the... Four. four he's is in it four, f five, oh. and six. Then he gets more point. unhinged after the burns and the scar as well. That's right. Um... I mean, he gets more unhinged as well as the plot becomes more ridiculous, to be quite frank. Uh, they, they, I think they ramped up the campness a bit uh, in the later franchise, didn't they? It was uh, trying to compete with all the ever more gory and shocking kills, which was a mistake. But especially when the first one, the whole point was, a lot of the time you didn't even see the kill or the gore, it was, it was just a stab in the, in the background and that was it. And that was the thing, a lot of the, the comments I noticed were complaining about this new one that's come out, that the kills weren't very original and not a lot of thought had been put into them. But then I remind them, other than Halloween 2, Halloween 1, how did he kill the people? He strangled one, stabbed one, strangled and stabbed another one, and stabbed another one against a cupboard door. I mean, it's not exactly finesse killings here at the, at the best of times. Um, all that finesse killings and all those ridiculous slayings with different props that came in the crap movies the sequels that came after it and like this this new one somebody with a shotgun yeah in this new one all he does is stab people and he stamps on one guy's head and it kept it simple and that's what he would do he, he's not like the ronald dino of serial killers here he's not going to be doing fancy tricks with the knife no but um i think that they've got a point in that the the one that's out now is very unoriginal. And I don't see the real point of making it, I'll be honest, because it's been done. I, here's the thing for, for me when I watched it, and I think this is the, the best way to go into this new film. If you're like me and you like the original Halloween and Halloween 2, um, think of it as an alternate ending to Halloween 1. Don't think of it as like a new film or, or don't think of it as in a way to forget that two ever happened. Just think of it as an alternate ending to the first one. Um, opposed to seeing it as a new movie that needs to answer questions or, or I don't know, answer something that wasn't answered in the original movie. Just see it as not a, an extra long <laughs> extended ending. Uh, it was I also thought... a great chance to wipe the slate clean of, let's face it, an incredible amount of rubbish that had built up. Especially, uh, you've got the Rob Zombie that took it a whole other direction, and then the H2O in Halloween Resurrection, which was an absolute stinking pile that needed wiped away. Yeah, that's, that's very true. Um, you know, it sort of gets rid of all that stuff. But they did have... Um... Uh, what's it called, H2O or something, uh, the uh, um, Halloween 20, uh, is it, uh, or, or something like that, where uh, J Jamie Lee Curtis comes back. And this is uh, basically like H40 now. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. <laughs> it's uh, 
Um, yeah, Hall Halloween H twenty twenty years later, it's called. Um, was was there a point in doing this when you've got Halloween H twenty? Yeah, I, I think I think there was a, a point because that film it was just awful. Um, yeah, it, it was not the best. It, it, it depending on whether or not you like this this new one that's come out. I think it's almost given a little bit of respect back to the original films, which it's never really had. It's always had the piss taken out of it, effectively. It's always been made fun of, ridiculed. Michael Myers is now no longer scary. Michael Myers is like the, the cool guy in the cool mask. But this film has made him kind of scary again. It, it also got rid of all the supernatural stuff. And it got rid of it where H two O or H twenty, it it brought in a lot of stuff there. Where instead of it Halloween being an originator of ideas and its own thing, H two O was basically, or in fact explicitly in some parts, took in huge amounts of influence from the parodies of Halloween, like Scream and I Know What You Did and so on. So it ended up instead of being original, it was now borrowing heavily from the things that were copying it and parodying it which just made it a sort of mess towards the end. And in fact, H2O even took uh, Scream's soundtrack and used it for chase scenes and stuff. So even the music, which obviously the first one was famous for, ended up becoming derivative completely and just copying completely uh, films which were actually copied it originally. <laughs> what a mess. I think, though, that even this is a bit of a mess. I mean, the plot devices are a bit reaching, to be honest. I mean, this whole obsession with him, with wanting to try to get him to talk, I, I think I find that a bit ridiculous, to be quite honest. It's the mad doctor sort of brought into a modern setting, but, but rather than the, it's alive! <laughs> But, but it's not just the the two uh, the the mad doctor e either is it? It's the two journalists as well, and I, I find it a bit much to be quite. I I, I can't believe it. It it to me reeks of nonsense, and it, for me that coupled with the fact that I've seen all this before in the very first Halloween, I, I'll I'll be honest, it it bored the arse off me. But then again, in its defence. Those two doctor, well, sorry, the two journalists at the start and the doctor who try and get him to speak, all get their heads smashed in by this guy. And Jamie Lee Curtis, who is told by her family, go and say goodbye to Michael Myers, go and speak to him. She refuses, and she's the one that ends up killing him because she doesn't want to speak to them. She doesn't want to negotiate with them. And I think the deaths of the journalist, uh, who gets his head panned in against the, the door of the cubicle. His female um, colleague, she gets her throat crushed, and the doctor who wants to speak to him gets his head stamped on. And is, I think that could be the writer's way of saying, this is what happens when you try and speak to people like this. You're not going to rationalize with them, and it is ridiculous. And that's why they suffered the three most violent deaths in the entire movie. It brought back I... Michael as a force of nature as well, just like he used to be. I did notice that, you know, that that whole thing. But but that okay, that's what uh, narrative that you're trying to bring out in the film. But it, to me, you you're trying to make that sort of philosoph philosophical comment or whatever too artificially, and um, for me, it just it didn't seem real. The, the the whole point about the first film is that it seems so very real. That's why it's effective. Um, whereas this seemed a bit farcical at times, I'll be honest. Perhaps the, the problem with the new one compared to the old one was the original, when you think about it, the location was very tight. It was this, as you mentioned, urban area. You know, it looked, you know, obviously it had been a real place where it was filmed, and it felt like a local community. Well, the new one, you jump from a hospital to a remote home, you follow journalists, they go to garages, you know, there's, there's all these different locations. And instead of building up this world that feels real, and then with the first one, the, the brilliance of it was showing you the threat immediately, then building up the world. But while it was building up, it kept dropping in this sort of stalker just to remind you 
that this threat at any time could step in and break what you're watching being built in front of you. Well, the new one, it, it didn't have that situation. It, it was a very different flow to it. Yeah, and, and in fact, you've sort of hit upon a, a really important point here in that the first one, although it's, you know, it's, a, it's an extremely well-developed world and everything, and yet at the same time, you have a feeling of claustrophobia. And, and that's extremely well done. That you know that you have this idea that there is that there are boundaries, extreme boundaries, and yet there aren't. You know, you you know that they could they could run away uh, to the other side of town or whatever, um, or to the next uh, uh, village or, or something like that. But yet they seem to be limited, and, and they seem to be kind of kept into this small location. But yet you, you don't really notice that that's artificial in any way. But a, a lot of a lot of his, his films have that same thing, don't they? Escape from New York, it's a you know, maximum security prison that's isolated. You can't escape um, the thing. They're stuck in this outpost in the Antarctica. And it's, it's the same sort of thing that a carpenter really taps into this even though you could run away and open the door and run down the street like a normal person would, or you can stay locked in this house with a serial killer. <laughs> yeah, but uh, and and yet, um, I, I mean, in, in those locations that, that you've mentioned, you do have limitation. You you do have um, uh, markation of limits where you cannot go beyond, uh, and and physically for very good reasons. But in this, you, you have sort of this mental boundary, this psychological boundary. And it's in, in a way, it's more effective, I think, actually, because, the, you know, the, the limits are, are open, but yet they seem to be set at the same time. It's, it, it, you know, it's, it's really effective what, what is done. And, and be, because it's it's taking the normal and making it abnormal. Yeah, I think that's probably what made the first and the second probably the continuation just that sort of movie magic where it had it, and it, and it makes sense when you watch the characters. As you see, you don't say think, well, why didn't they just get in a car and drive two hundred miles away to the tank was empty? Because when you watch Laurie, what does he do? She do she stumbles in fear to a neighbour, she stumbles to somebody else, and you could imagine that completely in a panic. You might not think, right, bugger everybody else of getting in a car and driving 200 miles. You would probably rush in a panic, your heart racing to a neighbour, and that does you no good, to another neighbour, and you can end up limiting to half a street. That whole world ends up becoming nothing but half a street with you and Michael. Yeah, and yeah, yeah it's very true. And you've also got to remember as well, something that's really interesting about the original film is that for the last half of the film, there's only really two locations, and that's the house where she's doing the babysitting in, and her friend's house where uh, the the guy, he stabbed up against the closet door. And those two houses are, in, in effect, a world or a labyrinth in itself. He's always hiding behind a couch or behind a curtain or in a cupboard or in the basement or something like that. So those become locations and almost like a, like a character in themselves that they can't escape from. So even though she could run at the door and down the street, get in a car and drive 200 miles away, they can't seem, even seem to be able to get out, get out of these houses safely. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, another thing that adds to the effect uh, as well is the music. Uh, we, we ought to say a little about the music because it's, uh, I find that very interesting, you know, Michael Myers' theme. Immediately, the, the music adds to the dread. And I was thinking about what is it about the music that, uh, that does that to the senses? Because it does sort of give you, you know, these, uh, it makes your heart rate faster. And I, I had to think about it. And what, what you've got is this, this high-pitched piano, of course, which, um, which is very shrill. And, and, and so it's sort of, um, it's almost painful on the ears and everything. Uh, and, and that's quite fast.
But then underlying that, you've got this sort of electronic snare drum thing that goes extremely fast. And, and that, that carries the sort of intensity of the heartbeat, if you like. It makes the heartbeat go faster. Um, equally, what I noticed with it as well is that it's not too dissimilar from Tubular Bells by Mike Oldfield, the version that was used in The Exorcist, uh, because the, uh, the film version and the album version are slightly different. Um, but, um, but the version that was used in The Exorcist with the high piano and everything, it's pretty much that thing. So you've got a, another reference, if you like, because of course he's, you've got a lot of psycho references in there, um, especially with, with the knife, of course, and, and, and even with the actress, uh, Jamie Lee Curtis, her mother, of course, is Janet Lee, who was, uh, was in Psycho. Uh, yeah. And, and Loom, uh, Sam Loomis, of course, is one of the characters in Psycho. So, um, uh, but, but here you've got a, um, a reference to the exorcist uh, and in the exorcist of course you've got this idea of demonic possession and that to me sort of um, it um, it gives you an idea of perhaps where the evil is coming from that perhaps it's not Michael himself that it's not psychological because of course all the psychologists they fail um, all the psychiatrists fail um, and, and, and the other little thing that, that I was thinking about uh, of, of the music, um, just to go back to um, Tubular Bells, um, Tubular Bells is a trick. I once saw Michael Oldfield uh, and interviewed uh, about why that sort of sticks in your brain, and, uh, and he said it's a trick. He, said, he says that uh, in the first bar there are eight beats, and in the second bar there are seven and your mind expects the eighth beat and it thinks that there's something wrong when it doesn't happen and that's why and that's why that's so effective in in that film um and why it's so disturbing and i thought that that was uh, very interesting um we we ought to do uh, the exorcist next uh, halloween actually didn't we well well the thing about the, the here's where i have a little bit of a different viewpoint on this dave is that the Tubular Bells theme tune that's in The Exorcist is only in it for about 15 to 20 seconds. And that's in the scene where the mother is, is walking home. She sees the nuns walking down the street and their robes are blowing. And there's a kind of a cut scene to Reagan, um, you know, screaming in this hospital um, thing while these doctors are trying to hold her down. But the Tubular Bells um, tune is not the theme tune to The Exorcist. Um, the Exorcist's score is all this drone, sort of creepy, screechy um, violin strings being um, like pulled apart. And it's got this really, it's not really music in, in many ways, um, but Tubular Bells was, came out and it was used as a trailer music. And Michael Field's often spoken about this, how his beautiful piece of piano music is now seen as being creepy because of the film and it wasn't creepy then added into the film it has become creepy because of the film whereas john carpenter's theme was deliberately written for halloween to specifically be creepy and add tension and atmosphere into it all right that, that's interesting um it, it's true that the uh the, the music for tubular bells has sort of become very much associated with the film um, although I mean, you know, I can, I, I don't find it creepy myself, uh, um, but it, it, I think that the reason they used it was because of that psychological trick that um, uh, that Michael Field did with with the two bar system, and and that it gives that sort of effect that disturbs your mind. Um, let's not forget that Michael Field, um, his mental stability is not great and and he you know he has had complete breakdowns of insanity and so on um so there is that sort of connection there uh, in that he can probably see things and and how the mind works better than most well absolutely but but like i said if that was the case for the entirety of the movie if it was played every time reagan 
uh, McNeil, I think her name is in the movie, um, done something creepy like make her head spin round and he put the the exit, sorry, the tubular bells theme tune behind it or just before it, I would understand that. But with Carpenter's music, the, the music is specifically written um, for each individual scene. When Michael's stalking, there's this dun dun, dun dun um, sound that gets your heartbeat. It's like a heartbeat. And tubular bells, it, it, it wasn't really um, like that in The Exorcist. It was just like a, a scene in the film that was a little bit creepy. Whereas the music is everything in Halloween. Yeah, I'll, uh, you know, I'll give you that. There, there are two ways to use music, though. And one is sparingly, uh, and one is as a, as a theme. I mean, really, uh, Carpenter's is Michael Myers' theme, ultimately. Um, whereas um, with The Exorcist, different kind of film, you, you don't have a sort of central um, serial killer or something like that. Um, it's so. So the two th films work very differently, uh, and and I and I think that that's perhaps why. I think just touching on what you said about the use of the music, that's uh, in general with Halloween. What made the first one such a success was the sound, and almost everything about it was about restraint. Also in the filming, which partly down to the budget, but it did work excellently compared to another film which you could just have a non-stop soundtrack and you could add in all sorts of things that probably explain and show too much the, the restraint and the music and everything else is I think actually added to it greatly and John Carpenter writes some fantastic music for his films he's really underrated as a musician um, his, his score for The Fog is fantastic his score for Escape from New York is fantastic um, he even managed to get Ennio Morricone to, to compose some parts of it. He always makes music um, almost a character in the movie. It uh, feels like it's made for the film and somebody didn't just get a nice bit of music to put in place. Yeah, they didn't just get um, Zimmerman to come along with a cello and like drag one note for like an hour and a half, like what he does in all his um, scores. He He actually goes into this... Um, ability where he taps into your heartbeat, into your emotions, what makes you tense, uh, where Zimmerman always makes you tense. And John Carpenter, he seems to be able to manipulate your emotions with the music. And I think that's amazing. How he, he's, But he's never really given that much credit for that. Yeah, that's uh, very true, actually. He always seems to write the music for his... Uh... Uh, films, doesn't he? Uh, and and always find the right tone. Um, and and in fact, um, for the new Halloween, uh, he and his son wrote the music, didn't they? Uh, along with, um, I think it was um, David Davis's uh, son from the Kinks. So the three of them, if I remember rightly, oh wow, did the uh, um, did the music for for the new one. Mm -hmm. Um. And, and and he also uh, wrote the music for, even though he didn't uh, direct it or didn't write, uh, write anything for it, he, he um, also did the music for Halloween 3 Season of the Witch, didn't he? Which is a very different film. Yeah, with um, Alan Howarth, I think his name is. Uh, he was, they done a lot of stuff together, like Big Trouble in Little China. But Halloween 3 soundtrack is actually really, really good. I think it's even creepier. In the first two um, soundtracks, um, it's got this weird, it's almost like a horrible feeling you get when you listen to it where you just feel it's this cold, wet blanket on you. And not many musicians can really do that, just make you genuinely scared just by listening to the music. You don't need the film. You can sit and listen to the Halloween soundtrack on your headphones and be creeped out by it. <laughs> yeah. Um, they, uh, I mean, they um, they produced uh, um, uh, uh, John Carpenter and, and Deborah Hill again, his girlfriend. They they produced uh, Halloween three, but they didn't um, uh, do anything more than that. Um, and, and uh, but yeah, you're you're right with the uh, uh, with the music and everything. And 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 you're right. Uh, I think that um, that it has a. It's, I I personally con consider Halloween three. As the best of the Halloweens, 
even though no, controversial did, yeah just despite its flaws and everything <laughs> despite its flaws and it's nothing to do with michael myers and everything i personally rate this as the best of the halloween films i think we all like it all three of us i think we all like it quite a lot and here's what i say to people in, in most people who like the film say the same thing, so this is nothing new. If you just pretend that Halloween 3, um, that title doesn't exist, and watch it by its secondary name, which is Season of the Witch, and see it as a standalone film that's got nothing to do with Michael Myers, and just appreciate it for what it is, it's, it's a creepy movie, it's scary, it's disturbing. Yeah. Fantastic yeah. ending as well. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. It's, it's one of the uh, few, well, um, horror-wise, um, you, you know, they actually managed to save the day. Um, so it's it's quite an upbeat ending. Oh, there's a possibility that they didn't remember, because it cuts right on the last one, so you're left with just enough ambiguity whether or not he really did. Ah, well... Um... I've sort of got an idea of that because um, how, how, how far is this going to go exactly, this plan of his? You see, the, the, the problem is, and, and this is one of the plot flaws and something that the critics saw straight away, and that's that basically it's all set for a specific time on Halloween, isn't it? Uh, all, all these uh, masks are set to go off at the same time. Yes? Except if you live on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. Exactly. Where it might well, happen if you were to cover that, though. Everyone's remember the time zones. Remember that the hero uh, deliberately sets him off by showing the subliminal message broadcast. So you see that it's actually the subliminal message broadcast that triggers it rather than the time. So as long as you see that broadcast any time then you'd be finished off. If you remember, the, they did the test audience with the, the salesman's son, and they show the video early to him, and the son gets killed. Oh, that's a good point. Ah, yeah. yeah that's, and uh, he destroys that's the whole true, place yeah. by setting it off that way. And is he not, like, does he not make a line where he's specifically pissed off against the Americanization of Halloween with all the geysers and the trick-or-treating and the, the jack-o'-lanterns and he talks about how he wishes it was back in the olden days in Ireland where the, the blood of infants would s like soak the soil and stuff like that. Was it not his grudge against the like the degeneracy of what um, Halloween w was becoming? So for him, anybody watching the commercials in his mind deserved it because you and you're falling for the commercialism of Halloween. So he wants to show this <laughs> all around the world, and anybody that falls for it didn't deserve to go through Halloween anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is um, quite a, an interesting critique, uh, especially as, uh, don't forget that it's all done through the television. And so you, you, you have the sort of television as the instrument of evil for children. And it was also playing off at the time, there was a lot of fear about subliminal messages, hidden in music and video, and the, obviously the, the fear of electronics and technology, the mystery of it, and you see all of that come into it. And yeah, this this sort of um, these are big themes for us, aren't they? Well, that's the thing I, I was saying earlier on, um, that at that particular time, and I'm sure it had been going on for a lot longer before then. I was only a little kid at that time, but. Music, um, rock stars, heavy metal artists, they were all at that time being accused of putting subliminal messages in their music, using their albums, play them backwards, and you hear incantation to Satan and the Dark Lord and all that. So people were genuinely scared about stuff like that back then. Then you have a movie that is, is basically about using subliminal messages to kill your kids. Yeah, that, that's right. Um, when, when was the Judas Priest trial, I'm trying to remember? That was sometime in the 80s. It must have been around that time. Yeah, um, and you had D. Schneider from Twisted Sister. They were they were in court as well because apparently um, some song made this kid blow his own face off with a shotgun. And 
yeah, it, it was it was a really interesting time to like look back on and see that. But here's the thing, and this is what I think. I mean, Marilyn Manson absolutely puts um, audio backwards in his music, and if you do play it backwards, you do hear things. Um, and it is subtle. Whether or not it's actually making people do crazy stuff is another argument. But this movie, Halloween 3, said that this will make your kids freak out and do, do horrible stuff to them. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I've just uh, put it up here. Uh, in, in fact, um, the kid blew his head off uh, listening to Judas Priest, apparently, uh, in 1985, and the trial was in 1990. So it's, it's actually later than the film. But you're right that, that these uh, these things had been uh, talked about for quite some time. Uh, I remember, uh, for example, there was a lot of controversy about Iron Maiden's Number of the Beast album, which um, I believe it was in the same year as uh, Halloween 3, uh, if I remember rightly. Yeah, uh, 1982 is... Uh, um, it came out, uh, Halloween 3, and, uh, and, and the album uh, as well, Number of the Beast, was 82, as I remember. Mm -hmm. and, and so... Um, there was a lot of controversy about that, saying that Iron Maiden was Satanists and so on, and that they were putting uh, satanic messages in their albums. Naughty Iron Maiden. Yep, don't listen to Iron Maiden, kids. Rock your yep. brain. <laughs> but, but listen to Nicki Minaj, Justin Bieber, whatever his name is, and all these other idiots. Uh, they won't rot Music your brain whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. That's right, yeah, ex exactly. Um, because, of course, um, anything with any intelligence to it is bad, whereas anything that's dumbed down is good. Yep, and easy to swallow. And, and of course, um, in this uh, film, you get um, the kids having their brains literally rotted, don't you? And turned into sort of insects and snakes and so on. Yeah, and you see that there's um, the scene where... Uh, oh God, what's his name again? The doctor um, Tom Atkins plays. He goes into the the ex-wife's house, and he pulls like the most lousy masks that you could ever possibly hope to get from your father on Halloween. And the kids have already got their special um, Cochrane masks on, and they're sitting around the TV and they're watching it. They're like an inch from the TV while this flashing strobe light is is, is um, playing out on the screen. And the parents don't seem to care. They don't seem to notice. And the kids mindlessly sing the advert over and over again each day. Yeah, and they're doing these creepy hand gestures and like this weird um, dance. And it's, it's really disturbing. And people don't really give that movie the credit it deserves. Um, the creepy part of that movie for me is what these masks and what this advert and this um, subliminal messaging is doing to the children in the movie. Yeah, that's um, that. I mean, the when the kid dies, you, you know, and, and he sort of puts his hand to his head, and, and you know, and the mask just sort of caves in. That that for me is a really disturbing scene. Yeah, uh, and that's and it's really disgusting and creepy. <laughs> that's right, and 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 it you don't really see any gore or horror, and you know, gore or anything like that. But that for me is far more disturbing than say, Michael Myers killing someone, you know, by pushing his thumb through through the forehead or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, there, but there is a sort of Michael Myers type of character in that. And strangely enough, the guy who plays the, the weird um, stalkerish guy in the brown suit who puts his fingers through the, the guy's eyeball um, at the start of the movie and sets fire to himself, that guy played Michael Myers in the second Halloween movie. So that is Michael Myers in many ways. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah, you that. see. Uh, <laughs> so he is in this, the third movie. And people just don't know it. Only for the Ultra fans, folks. There's the hot takes and tips. Yeah, just remember, I don't really have much of a life these days, and I know all these creepy and dressing facts. <laughs> <laughs> And apparently, Jamie Lee Curtis is also in the film, and she's the uh, the one that announces the curfew on the tannoy. Oh wow! That's right, yeah. 
And also, if if you really want to get nerdy about this, um, the girl who whose name I forget, she's also in Assault and Precinct Thirteen. Um, she is the ex-wife of the doctor. Remember the the girl who's murdered, and she has the, the headstone put above her head in the first movie. She's sprawled out in the bed. That is the ex-wife in the third movie. Hmm. And all these things you can't imagine have been accidental, so somebody must have been having fun writing this. Yeah. And her name in real life is Nancy Loomis. <laughs> yeah, all these creepy coincidences are all connecting together, aren't they? Yeah, they are, absolutely. It's, uh, Illuminati it's... confirmed. Yeah, we're on to you, John. <laughs> Uh, you, you do sort of have uh, Michael Myers type figures in in the film as well with these androids as well, don't you? Yeah, yeah, they're sort of guys in the black suits and the unresponsive. Uh, well, they're responsive to, to Cochrane, but you can't like plead with them. Um, you're not going to well, rationalise with them. Produced Michael Myers in a way with all the connotations that might bring. Yeah, it's like lots of little Michael Myers. Yeah, and, and of course, you uh, as well, you've got the idea of the mask uh, transforming you somehow. And also, some of the things which happened, in the, especially in the first three movies, are how the hell did he do that? And there's a little funny joke about that in the third movie, where he's talking about this stone that they managed to steal from Stonehenge. And the doctor asks him, how the hell did you do this? And Cochrane replies by saying something like, uh, oh, you wouldn't believe me even if I told you. And it answer, it what well, kind of semi answers the questions in the first movie. How did he manage to get that greystone and carry it halfway across the town up a flight of steps? I mean, it, little things like that. How did he learn to drive? Uh, who taught him? Where did he get that mask from? Why was it the only mask in the town that looked like that? Um, Lots of little unanswered things which you you want to know, but although Halloween two, there's two Michael masks in it, if you remember, because there's a guy who's accidentally killed because he looks just like him. Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. The, the so ambulance they, crashes they into him. If you remember, Michael stole the mask from a local shop. So if you think if he stole it that night, it'd be believable that a kid. This seventeen-year-old kid bought them, bought the same mask on in stock before my, uh, Michael went in and robbed another one. That's right, because the, the cop in the first movie, he's, I'm sure Loomis asked him, was was anything stolen? And the cop says something like, uh, "Oh, a couple a mask of masks." Two uh, knives, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it could have been someone that broken after, you know, Michael Myers broken the first time, and this kid broken just afterwards or looted it. And grab the the other mask, and that's why they mistook him. And the the well, Loomis um, thinks it's him, and he walks out in front of an ambulance, and the ambulance crashes into him and pins him against another ambulance, and it catches on fire, and he the kid burns to death. I, I think that really it, it's just um, this mask is uh, is pretty commonplace, and and he probably got the mask. Um, at some point to dress up for Halloween prior to the event. In that world, it's not uh, unheard of. No, because I, I seem to remember, wasn't there a row of masks uh, like that uh, in the place where uh, Michael Myers stole it from? I'm not sure if you actually see it because most of the shots are outside the store. Um... Yeah, I don't know. It's just coincidental how he just happened to pick the creepiest mask you'd find after breaking into implied, one store. Though. It is implied, though, it's something he just took off the shelf at the general store rather than, you know, he didn't go to somebody to get some custom crafted thing. He's just making do. And he's probably picked out the creepiest one because it spoke to him. Hmm, hmm. Yeah, because, uh, of course, as Michael Myers knows, masks speak to you. Yeah. And you had a, an interesting um, theory of, about uh, the similarities between Arnold Schwarzenegger and the Terminator to Michael Myers, didn't you? Oh, yeah. If you look at the, 
the first one uh, rather than the later ones if you look at the first Terminator you definitely get the feeling that it could have been inspired by Michael Myers you've got this it's essentially a slasher with guns and a robot rather than a semi-supernatural psychopath mm. you see this slow almost always slow moving he's always there when you're on the run somehow he's always there around the corner or you bump into him he's unstoppable you shoot him, you stab him, and he keeps coming back up. He's got one purpose. Yeah. You can see there's there's a definite sort of slasher Halloween connection. Even when you think of the original, the way some of the music was used wasn't entirely dissimilar. And the fact that it follows the killer so much rather than just following the, the heroes or the victims and then having the monster jump out at them like it would have done in a Universal film, maybe. Yeah, and... If you if you look at the Terminator as well, he kind of looks like Michael Myers, especially that scene where he's he's operating on his eyes, cutting his his eyeball out and and fixing the damage that he, he took. Um, he kind of looks like Michael Myers in, in that regard as well. He then he puts on the the black leathers and the the big high collar uh, leather jacket and he cuts his hair and it's all short and you're like that's that's Michael Myers. I mean. It's even the part where both of them, when they're sort of punished heavily, be it gunshot stabbing, they fall down and then get back up. They don't just ignore it. They always sort of fall down, recover, and then get back up. And you see, of course, the Terminator does that. And sometimes they show like, the science babble of the electronics in front of them, backup system coming on. But it's the same concept, that it bounces back. Yeah, yeah. Um, go, going back to the um, kind of transportation of the um, this uh, rock of Stonehenge, one of one of the uh, um, big um, stones. <laughs> it's int- I think that that uh, because it, it uses um, a lot of myth, um, like for example the sacrifice of children during Samhain, um, and I think that that's a reference to Merlin, you know, because in Arthurian legend. He transports uh, Stonehenge from Ireland to where it is now, and um, and it's never explained how. It's always uh, you, you, it's always kind of given a gloss over, like um, you, you know, he transported it over um, as easily as uh, you know as you would imagine, or something like that. And 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 it's never told how he actually did it. And I personally think that that might be a reference to Merlin. Oh, wow. Could well, be. There's, there's definitely a sense of deeper magic behind it that's never explained. Would that have been something that uh, Nigel Neal would have... Because I'm sure he wrote Halloween originally in its basic form. Was he was he into that kind of Arthurian legend where he would have made that connection and thought he'd write it in there as a bit of a joke? Uh, Nigel Neal is a smart guy. He would have he would have read these things. Um, I, I have no doubt about that. One of the interesting things is as well. Um, I mean, Nigel Neal and John Carpenter in some ways are quite similar, in that they blend the supernatural and the science fiction. Um, although Nigel Neal always uh, explains the supernatural through science fiction. Um, whereas, uh, well, and, and actually, you can sort of see that in Carpenter as well. To to think about it, um, he always explains the supernatural through science fiction, uh, for for the most part, anyway. And I and I think that that blend is very interesting, very Lovecraftian, of course. Yeah, he he seems to like the like I said before the the idea that there's this sinister, I don't know, uh, black um, entity that, that floats around and, and it, it can almost possess people, but it, it's not an individual uh, um, force. It's it's lots of little individual forces. Uh, even in The Thing, uh, there's a particular reference that every single cell is an individual in its own, and it's all got this capability of multiplying. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I, I was thinking. I mean, the um, the biggest film of Carpenter's where you've got the 
the supernatural and the uh, explained by science is uh, um, go on Prince of Darkness. Yeah, yeah. When it got these scientists observing this sort of green goop in this jar. That's right, and and this idea that um, it's a the, the devil or, or whatever is the a being of antimatter. Mm. And and the, the when the people in Prince of Darkness are infected by this green goo, in fact, even the people who are infected by the the bacteria and the thing, they they all they're all kind of Michael Myers in many ways. They're all very similar to Michael Myers. These slow shuffling um, things that you can't communicate with you can't rationalize with them so maybe in a very deep way john carpenter is suggesting that all these like um evil characters in his movies all these dark sinister characters they're all effectively the same thing yeah all the all effectively almost zombie like when you think about it yeah and that makes me wonder if, you got to question his, his politics when all his movies are the same, very, very, very incredibly, incredibly coincidental similarities to them. Yeah, I, I mean, he's he stated that he's of the left, but but he's of that sort of earlier type of left that was still rational and and still had um, certain you know pre SJW left really. That um, that had certain ideas that were congruent with the uh, with the radical right, actually. But he, for me, he doesn't really seem to, or maybe he does. Maybe you think differently. Um, but I'll give you an example. In Assault in Precinct Thirteen, there's this scene where the the gangster, who's played by Frank Doubleday, who is the creepy um, weirdo in Escape from New York, he. He turns and shoots the kid, and he shoots the kid through her ice cream. And there's blood everywhere. She falls down, and you think to yourself, why would, why would a gangster just do that? Why would, why would anybody, do that sort of thing unless something took control of them and made them do it? Uh, they don't seem to have any moral convictions. They don't seem to have any kind of rationale about them that you could say, hey, uh, you know, going a bit too far there. Yeah, the, there is this sort of negative view of the masses, isn't there? And, and that's very elitist when you think about it. There are always sort of the the mass and those who are individuals. And, and that is, again, a very rightist idea when you think about it. You see that reflected in the Escape films as well. It's a very similar pattern between the, the individuals and the masses. And the, the masses that are now in the prison, they're kind of reverting back to, uh, you know, what they they, they probably would, wouldn't get away with in normal society. And you have the leader of it all, who I've said before in a, in a podcast, the, the first thing the leader does is Duke of New York. Uh, the first thing he does is get himself a Cadillac with some chandeliers, golden chandeliers on it, and some um, bouncy suspension. Um, then you have all these other people who are just crazy and uh, cannibalistic and animalistic. They're running around in furs and uh, you even have references to the crazies who I think are a reference to the George Romero movie, The Crazies. I think it, it was a little nod saying that all those people in that movie were arrested and then put into this maximum security prison in New York. Um, and I think it, it kind of lends from that in many ways. Uh, and obviously the crazies was based on Night of the Living Dead and they're once again slow s shuffling um, they, they look harmless when you see them from a distance but when they get up close and you realize they're supernatural in strength and they're dangerous and they're relentless uh, it's all the same thing to me yeah you're, you're very true um, now uh, I, I think that that's a great note to uh, to sort of end things on. But um, I, th I think that before I bring the clo the shows to a close, um, I ought to ask, uh, what do you think then? Uh, would you advise people to watch 
2018's uh, version of Halloween, or um, or what other Halloween films would you recommend? I definitely say that the 2018 is a love letter to the dedicated fans of the franchise. If you're that kind of person, you'll get your money's worth out of it. If you're looking for a horror film, possibly, and you're not much of a uh, aficionado of the, the whole genre, you probably also would enjoy it. Uh, the awkward middle ground is where you've seen the films already and you can remember some of it. Y you might f better just going back to the original Halloween and enjoying that in its fullest. Halloween 1, Halloween 2, Halloween 3 are all solid films that you could recommend any time without any qualifications like I might have to with 2018. And for me, um, I would say, when I wanted to see the movie, I was actually hoping all the way through it that it was going to be bad. I was praying that there was going to be a lot in it that would really annoy me, that would give me the excuse to just get up off my seat and walk out in disgust. But I found myself staying to watch the entire thing. And I think it was because I was expecting it to go down some kind of ultra-left liberal um, route where Michael Myers was going to go to some... LGBT rights party and like befriend them and he wasn't going to be so bad after all and there was going to be it's some kind of <laughs> political message yeah, in if it. If you look at the characters, it's actually very positive from a lot of point of views where the family in it is shown as this very stable, good family. The father is a, is a good man. He's not flawed or terrible or pervert like in the other versions to Halloween yeah. eh, or horror films. So it does actually have a lot of positives about it, especially being released in 2018 when you compare it to the suffering we've had through various reboots that have brought in all the men as terrible figures or hammered home, home horrible politics. It avoided all of that. When for that alone, it's probably worth supporting with your cinema ticket. Yep. And there was there was a scene though, and I almost, I almost thought it was going to happen. Uh, it's about halfway through the movie where the, the young blonde uh, babysitter, she's looking after the, the little black kid and I thought to myself, they're going to do it here they're going to make this blonde girl an absolute outright racist and she's going to die in the most horrible way for bullying this little black kid and it never happened they never they never done anything like that um, they never forced any political opinion down my throat, at least what I noticed anyway, it almost felt like it they realized that this is not the route to go down. You can't take something that is beloved by millions upon millions of people and use it as a political message to, um, you know, support some kind of rights for some group of people who are feeling victimized that week. It avoided all that for me. The demographics and the characters reflect the 70s films quite well. Yeah, and, and even if you look at it, even though it's set 40 years after Halloween, you can almost imagine it being filmed in the late 70s or early 80s. There's not an emphasis too much on technology, although there is a scene where the young girl's phone is thrown into the, the, the strawberry trifle or whatever, and she walks away from it. She's like, I don't need my phone. Now, I know if that was my phone, I'd probably be up to my elbow retrieving it. And a lot of kids would these days. And, and it would be the big emphasis of the, the film. Let's make the last half of the movie entirely and um, played out on a Skype call on a mobile phone, but they avoided that too. Now, they avoided all the, the sort of trends and cliches of the moment that you know a lot of films do, and then five years later it becomes incredibly dated. While Halloween, while it's set in the period, it doesn't date because it didn't go for these kind of things. I noticed one thing about the guy who threw the mobile phone into the trifle, and that uh, was during the dinner with uh, her parents, and he said that he was 7% Native American. Did you notice that? No. No, I never noticed that, no. And he told someone uh, you hope to die yeah. <laughs> for throwing that phone in the custard. Yeah. yeah. But, um, you, you know, so, so the father was very liberal, um... Uh, but, um, you, you know, and, and was a bit of an idiot, really, you know, a bit of a buffoon. And uh, the kid who, you know, sort of boasting about his 
seven uh, percent mixed race and and so on um he ended up being a bit of an asshole and uh and showing his pure colors uh, then and the director didn't yeah. seem to have much of a problem with that so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah he was right. the most unpleasant character in it apart yeah. from myers and he didn't die which is annoying because i actually part of me wanted him to be killed really horribly but instead they kill the the well-meaning sort of fat tubby friend who he's like is is the girl he loves and now separated from his best friend he makes his move and ends up being impaled in the garden fence and knifed to death (laughs) (laughs) at least though the film didn't have a ninja fighting buster rhymes yeah yeah like halloween resurrection did a dreadlocked michael myers after yeah. that low point, you could almost do anything. Very true. That's very true. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, that that's the only bit that I noticed that was um, uh, egregious, shall we say. Although, uh, you could also say it might just be the sort of Cherokee princess myth that almost every sort of left-leaning family seems to have. And interestingly, genetic tests proven often is uh, wrong most of the time. Ah, come on now. Elizabeth Warren has got at least 1% Native American <laughs> heritage. <laughs> she walked past a TP once, it counts. That's, that's right. Uh, she once had a curry. Oh no, wrong Indian. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> it was a buffalo curry, it still counts. <laughs> yeah. Um, my opinion is um, uh, that... Um, I wouldn't pay money to see this film, I'll be honest. Um, if it was on television, yeah, give it a watch. Uh, but but I wouldn't go to the cinema or anything like that. Well, the thing is, you, you, you've now got to say that you did go to the cinema and pay for it legally. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, just of in course. case anybody's listening. <laughs> Shh. Of course, I didn't do anything <laughs> illegal. Um, I was your good cinema. friend bought you the ticket. Yeah, learn from experience. Don't pay to see this movie. <laughs> That's right. I'm <laughs> advising you not to pay like I did. Yeah. I, I don't think they'll notice. Of course. <laughs> there you go. No, not at all. <laughs> right. Um, so, um, I'll wrap this up then, um, unless there's anything uh, to add. Oh, favourite kill by Michael. Even the, the most ridiculous. From the entire franchise, or and just the whole franchise? Mm. Dave's already mentioned my favourite with the the thumb in the head and the arms. <laughs> well, uh, my my favourite is that I thought that he killed the franchise itself, but that doesn't appear to be the case. <laughs> well, uh, my my one's got to be the second one, drowning the nurse in the boiling water. I don't think they've done anything quite as horrific as that since. So yeah, um, that's a bit too disturbing we'll... for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We'll set the tone light in the way out. <laughs> Sorry, people. That's right. We'll uh, leave it on that light-hearted point. Uh, so uh, I say uh, thank you uh, to uh, Neil and uh, James, and uh, and I wish you all a uh, good evening. Yep, I hope you have a scary evening if you're listening to this on Halloween. Don't get stabbed. Have fun. <laughs> Avoid people in masks. That's right. <laughs> so, until next time, bye for now to the ones who survived. Goodbye. 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 <laughs>